So, um, today I am going to talk to you a bit about uh, scientific computing in uh, a couple of subfields in uh, which I've been working, which are astronomy and astrodynamics. Uh, let me first of all thank a lot of the organizers for giving us the opportunity for being here today. It's an honor for us, of course. And uh, uh, Dario is on the talk title. Uh, he's a friend of mine, uh, my ex-boss from my days at the European Space Agency. He was really excited about the opportunity to give this keynote, but unfortunately was, uh, he caught a bad attack of bureaucratic red tape and he couldn't make it. But uh, everything I say today, uh, I will share the credit and blame of this talk with, with him. So uh, he's here in spirit. Um, so when the organizers of PyCon contacted us uh, with the prospect of giving this talk, uh, they said that they were interested in having some kind of uh, um, a keynote in a, in a kind of a different field with respect to what they had in the previous years. And they wanted a kind of uh, scientific or technical angle about the usage of Python. And so today I'm going to try to, to do that. I'm going to try to uh, give you a bit uh, of, of chronicles about two projects I've been working on, and uh, maybe to sprinkle the presentation with a bit of reflection or uh, a bit of uh, uh, thoughts about scientific Python uh, use in general. So, um, so that's the talk. I'm going to talk about specifically two projects, which is called Pagmo and AstroPy. And I'm going to talk mostly about Pagmo because uh, that's a project which I started when I was in European Space Agency together with Dario. And it's the software I'm uh, most intimately familiar with. Uh, AstroPy is uh, a project uh, I've been involved with since my uh, since the start of my job at the uh, Max Planck Institute in May. So I'm uh, uh, working with it, but I'm not as much intimate as uh, with Pagmo. So I will uh, devote a few slides towards the end to AstroPy. Um, a bit of a background about us. Uh, so my background is astronomy. I, I have a PhD in astronomy. I got from the University of Padua in Italy in 2008. After that, I had my first job, which was a research fellowship at the, uh, the European Space Agency in Holland, in the old Zealand. And uh, it, it was uh, in a team which is called the Advanced Concepts Team, ACT, which is a very interesting uh, place to work. It is essentially a multidisciplinary team which is tasked with uh, performing and fostering and monitoring research in a variety of fields which are not of immediate interest to the activity of the space agency, but it could be in a time frame of 20 to 30 years, so kind of advanced studies. And uh, it's a team of young researchers from all the kind of different backgrounds. So there are, of course, a lot of aerospace engineers, but also mathematicians, uh, uh, theoretical physicists, uh, even biologists and economists. Uh, it's a small kind of skunk work type of team. It's uh, an interesting uh, place to be. Uh, after that, uh, I spent a couple of years in the industry. I was a high-performance software engineer, uh, first in a, um, a Dutch research company in Rotterdam, and uh, then I moved to the UK, to Oxford, where I worked for a little more than one year in the oil industry uh, in a company called uh, Schlumberger. So uh, if you are familiar with the oil industry, you certainly know the name. And uh, uh, after that, I came back to the warm embrace of taxpayer-funded research at the uh, Max Planck Institute in uh, Heidelberg in Germany, and I've been there since May. So Dario has uh, instead a background in uh, aerospace engineering and a PhD in mathematical, mathematical statistics or statistical mathematics, I, I'm not exactly sure. And uh, he was also a research fellow at the European Space Agency from 2005 to 2007, and uh, after that he got offered the position as a scientific director of the ACT, and it's a position which he has, he holds since then. So a bit about the projects that I'm talking to you to, today about. Um, uh, PAGMO, the acronym is, stands for Parallel Global Multi-Objective Opt Optimizer. It's an optimization software. And uh, it was started in 2009, um, uh, 2008, 2009, building on existing uh, research code that had been developed in the advanced concept team over the previous years. So um, it was initially uh, coded as an interplanetary spacecraft trajectory optimization tool, uh, but it evolved to be a kind of a general purpose optimizer. Uh, Pagmo is very much kind of a, a research type of code uh, in the sense that it was not born to uh, solve a specific problem, uh, but it was in some sense born to solve, uh, to prove a point about research, you know, global optimization. And I will expand upon this point later. Um, it is essentially a mixed C++ Python code base, so we use two names for it. We have the 
uh, C++ core, which is called Pagmo, and the uh, Python part, which is called Pigmo. So you can decide, essentially, if you want to use it from C++ or from Python. Uh, you can just forget about the C++ and just do the, the, the Python coding if you uh, prefer, which is what we are doing mostly these days. And it's a project which is very much focused on parallel and distributed compute, computing with the high performance part. Uh, it's not huge. I mean, it's something like uh, 70,000 line of code, depending on how you count. Uh, we participated a few times to the Google Summer of Code with it and uh, to another program which uh, me and Dario started at the European Space Agency, which is called SOCHIS, which stands for Summer of Code in Space, which is, of course, a, a program inspired by the Google Summer of Code, which we run in the European Space Agency uh, and is devoted to funding the development of uh, space-oriented open source software. Uh, during the summer from European students. So if you have some uh, project which you would like to get some funding with, which is related to space, you can apply to that program. And we have this uh, fancy nice web page on uh, GitHub. Uh, about AstroPy, uh, AstroPy is a bit younger than, uh, than, Python, uh, than uh, Pagmo. Uh, it was started in 2011. Uh, and it is essentially a community effort to develop a single core package uh, for astronomy. Um, so. Uh, it aims to uh, provide professional astronomers with a set of basic tools to do their research. So tools such as uh, um, cosmological constants, uh, um, coordinate transformation, the handling of uh, spe spe spectroscopy image, uh, handling of astronomical data of all kind, and so on and so forth. Uh, it has a core and a an kind of archipelago of affiliated uh, packages around it, which uh, uh, are uh, built to interoperate with AstroPy and adopt the same coding style, but are not really uh, part of the core distribution. And it's developed by an international team of researchers from uh, a lot of different institutions in Europe and in the US mostly. And it's a, a package which is predominantly in Python with a few bits and pieces of C and Fortran around when, uh, for performance purposes, but it's mostly Python. And uh, uh, in, in some sense, it's similar but also different from Pagma in the sense that it's a tool which was created to solve a specific uh, problem and to provide a specific concrete tool uh, to professional astronomers more than a being research software per se. Uh, it's going to, to be a, probably 100,000 line of code soon. And it also participated to the GSOC uh, a few times. And uh, it has a very, very nice website with lots of information at uh, that address. So um, I will need to go through a couple of slides of introduction uh, about the topic of optimization uh, in order to talk about Pagma to, to make you understand what it's the background and why it was coded and uh, uh, what type of problems uh, it tries to solve. I have no idea if these slides are too much or too little to give you a, a, a background. Uh, I hope it would be useful for you, but it's just two or three slides of, of, uh, uh, of explanation. There is no mathematics involved, just a, a bit of, uh, of background information. So what is optimization? Optimization is one of the main areas of applied mathematics, and uh, this is the Wikipedia definition of, of optimization. But essentially, you have uh, some kind of uh, problem defined in, in, uh, uh, in terms of a set of parameters. And the optimization is the process of selecting a set of value for these parameters such that a property of your problem is maximized or minimized in some sense. Uh, it can often be formulated as a kind of a function minimization problem. Uh, in many cases, what you're trying to optimize is kind of a multivariate function, and you want to uh, uh, minimize or maximize the, the value produced by this function. Uh, there are classical examples of, uh, of optimization problem, uh, which uh, you might have heard of. Uh, one classical example is a traveling salesman problem. And in this problem, you have a, a, salesman, a salesman which have to uh, uh, visit a certain set of cities connected by roads, and he has to find the, the sequence of city to visit such that the amount of road he needs to travel is minimized. This is an example of uh, a very hard optimization problem because uh, as, as you keep adding more cities to the sequence, this explodes in a super exponential way in terms of complexity. And it's an example of a problem which you can just solve uh, with brute force. And you need to apply some kind of smartness in the way you try to, to solve it. Uh, another classical application is supply chain management. Um, network routing is also a classical example of the application of, of optimization techniques. And of course, what most concerns Pagma, which is interplanetary spacecraft trajectories. So once you have defined your optimization problem, uh, you have a lot of different 
algorithms that you can try to apply to solve your problem. And if you, you know, if you just do a bit of research on the Wikipedia, you will just find an endless list of different algorithms that you can apply, uh, apply to different problems in order to try to, to solve them. Uh, you have classes like the gradient-based methods, evolutionary algorithms, uh, dynamic programming, stochastic algorithms, and so on and so forth. There is a huge amount of literature about this topic because of its uh, practical interest. Actually, the field of optimization was kind of formally defined uh, around the time of the Second World War when uh, uh, it was essentially introduced to solve the logistics problem of, uh, of the war machine. So it, it has a, a kind of a, a, a historical of practical application. So interplanetary space trajectories. So um, a trajectory in a space mission is defined by a set of parameters. Uh, these parameters are things like the launch date, so when you want to leave Earth, uh, your initial velocity vector, which means essentially with which rocket you're departing from Earth, so different rockets will give you different uh, capabilities in terms of the speed you can uh, obtain. Um, the uh, initial direction in which you are leaving Earth from, uh, the sequence of flybys, you know that uh, you probably heard this uh, before, but uh, if you want to go anywhere in the solar system, which is a, a kind of a non-trivial destination, such as Mars or the Moon, uh, you often need to do this kind of flyby maneuver. So you're going to fly uh, in proximity of another planet, and you're going to steal a bit of its gravitational energy in order to uh, transmit it to the spacecraft, which will then uh, gain speed or will reduce speed depending on, uh, on what you want to do. And this is a maneuver you really need to do if you want to, to go anywhere like, um, uh, I don't know, uh, a moon of Jupiter or Saturn, or even if you want to go into the inner solar system like Mercury <laughs> or something like this. Uh, there is the sequence, another parameter of the, mis the mission is the sequence of uh, deep, deep space maneuvers, DSMs. So when you're flying between one planet and the other, you can uh, um, fire your thruster on the spacecraft and imprint a change in trajectory to your spacecraft in order to achieve some kind of objective, like to reach a specific point in space. But uh, when do you do this? At which part of the trajectory you do this? Uh, in which direction do you thrust? Which is the most uh, convenient way of doing this? And uh, uh, when we're talking about interplanetary spacecraft trajectories, 99% uh, of the time, the objective is that you want to minimize the fuel consumption. So you want to arrive somewhere in the solar system, and you want to arrive there uh, uh, using the least amount of fuel possible. And the reason for this is that, of course, the least fuel you use, you use the, the higher the weight you, are available, you have available on the spacecraft for your scientific payload, which is you know, the reason why you're doing the mission in the first place. So you're trying to cram as much uh, po uh, as possible uh, scientific instrumentation on the spacecraft, and you want to minimize the fuel needed for doing the trip. So if you, if you try to uh, formulate the problem of spacecraft trajectory uh, optimization uh, as an optimization problem, uh, you obtain what is called a hard optimization problem. So the, the objective function that you need to optimize is, uh, is very difficult to, to deal with. It's a multimodal uh, objective function, meaning that it, it has a lot of uh, maximum and minima, and uh, uh, you need to find the, the most convenient of these maxima that you want to exploit. It's highly nonlinear, so you have uh, all sorts of special functions entering here. You have uh, sines, cosines, you have uh, the solution of Kepler's equation that gets inside here a lot. So you can't apply techniques of linear optimization or these things which are well established. Um, it's uh, uh, highly dimensional, meaning that uh, you have a lot of parameters to optimize, and it's well known that you, the higher your dim the dimensionality of your problem uh, becomes, the exponentially more difficult it, it, it becomes to find uh, a solution to the problem. And uh, uh, traditionally, this type of task has been tackled by teams of human experts. So um, traditionally, what, uh, what uh, it, it's being done when uh, you pro project a space mission is that you have a team of aerospace engineers, and uh, they draw on their own uh, human expertise and their own experience. And they sit down, and they uh, uh, start you know, trying ideas for the trajectories. And over the course of weeks or months, they came up with a, a good trajectory and that satisfies the mission requirements. Uh, in the next slide, I have an example of a spacecraft trajectory. Uh, I apologize for the quality of the picture, but I didn't, couldn't find one with the higher resolution, unfortunately. Um, this is the trajectory of a spacecraft called Messenger, which has been orbiting Mercury since uh, a few years, I think, now. And uh, you see it's a very complicated uh, trajectory in which you start from the Earth at this point. Uh, you do a round. Uh, you do a flyby of the Earth, which changes your trajectory and al uh, allows you to arrive in proximity of Venus, Venus, 
where you do another flyby, and uh, you do successive flybys of Venus and then Mercury, and finally you arrive uh, to Mercury and you inject in the orbit around the planet. Um, and there are also kind of deep space maneuvers, these kind of black dots sprinkled around. This is a, a type of, uh, of a very hard problem to solve. And it's kind of counterintuitive that it's so difficult to get to the inside of the solar system rather than going, for instance, to Jupiter or to Saturn. Going to Jupiter or Saturn is comparatively easier. And the reason for that is, uh, uh, intuitively, uh, going to the inner solar system is a bit like tossing a coin in a kind of a funnel shape. So the, the, the coins start to spiral down close to the center of the funnel, and uh, uh, it starts to spin faster and faster because it's trading uh, gravitational energy for kinetic energy. So the problem here that uh, this trajectory solves is that of slowing down as you go closer and closer to the sun. So you're doing a lot of flybys and maneuvers in order to slow down and arrive to Mercury with a, a suitable uh, velocity vector so you can enter the, uh, the orbit around the planet. So this is a very difficult trajectory to, uh, to, to find out and to, uh, and to uh, architect. But it's an example of a thing that you can do in a mostly semi-automatic way with PAGMO nowadays. So uh, the last introductory slide, if you want, is, uh, is, that, uh, of, uh, is, the, is this one. So the idea be behind PAGMA, one of the reasons why it was developed in the first place, is that uh, we can try to make this, pro this uh, program of uh, uh, finding the, an optimal trajectory a kind of automated uh, procedure by exploiting um, kind of a recently introduced class of algorithm, which is called bio-inspired uh, optimization algorithms. These are groups of algorithms which are inspired by uh, biological processes. You might have heard of some of these, um, like genetic algorithms, uh, differential evolution. You might have heard the name ant colony optimization, um, particles worm optimization, or even more stranger names like artificial bee colony optimization. So these are uh, algorithms which are inspired by some processes in, in nature and which have been found in practice to be uh, able to tackle this type of hard problems such as uh, interplanetary trajectory optimization. And that was one of the premises uh, at the origin of PAGMA. And uh, another thing which is very specific to PAGMA and is not implemented in any other uh, software as far as I know, um, is this thing of the island model. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, when you have a very hard optimization problem, you don't know which algorithm is gonna be the best one to tackle the problem. So what you do, you adopt this island model, which is the idea that you let a lot of algorithms run in parallel and uh, kind of a multi-agent system. And uh, you, uh, you try to optimize the same problem with different algorithms. And from time to time, you have the algorithms communicating information with each other. Uh, and this uh, has been proven in practice to also be uh, uh, able to uh, uh, improve the convergence property of the problem. And so there was this very uh, focus on this island model since the beginning on PAGMO. And uh, you know, this really smells like a lot of like parallel computing. And in fact, that's one of the reasons uh, why we call it PAGMO, uh, to exploit a lot the, the parallel nature of, of, of modern computers. And uh, it's called island model, if you want a kind of a note of color. Uh, because it's inspired by the observation of Charles Darwin when he went to the Galapagos and uh, 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 he did his famous trips to the Galapagos and he observed that uh, the Galapagos are islands which are isolated from each other mostly. So you have a population of individuals which uh, uh, evolve separately on each island. But from time to time you have some kind of exchange of genetic material in, in terms of animals which are able to reach another island. And uh, uh, he conjectured that this improves the overall genetic health of the, of the archipelago by having this kind of equilibrium between isolated uh, uh, development and exchange of genetic material from the other islands. So that's where the name comes from. So uh, a bit of history about PAGMO. So uh, when I arrived in the, in the ACT, it was uh, late 2008, and uh, Dario explained to me a bit about these things, about uh, 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 meta-heuristic optimization, evolutionary algorithms, and so on. And um, uh, he told me, you know, we have a lot of code here which we have, we have developed, a lot of expertise which we have developed uh, over the previous two or three years. We published papers about this, and we wrote code about this, but uh, uh, it, will, it is not really in a state in which you can um, really reuse it or uh, extend it uh, furtherly or make it easy to understand to other people. And, uh, and this, is, you know, this was a kind of a very typical textbook pattern when you deal with scientific computing and scientific code. Uh, you have this, 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 uh, this pattern of code which gets developed to produce a paper and to prove a point, and that gets abandoned, and uh, it's not maintained anymore. 
this is something that you, uh, I, I, will, uh, I saw over and over in some sense in the following years. It's a, it's a common pattern in scientific computing, and I have some things to say about this later. Uh, so it was research code, which uh, uh, was kind of a scattered um, uh, group of C files and MATLAB files doing this type of uh, uh, optimization of spacecraft trajectories. It wasn't really extensible or easily usable by uh, anyone which wasn't already familiar with this architecture. So uh, the first thing I did when I started working with this code, I tried to give it a, 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 a sensible framework to this whole uh, bunch of, of, of code that, uh, uh, that was available. And uh, the first thing I did was to rewrite the whole thing in terms of a kind of a C++ object-oriented hierarchy and to try to separate really uh, clearly the concepts, the various concepts involved in this idea of doing uh, optimization with uh, different algorithms on, uh, in parallel at the same time. And uh, I immediately started writing as well the Python bindings to this because uh, I had previous experience with uh, interoperating between C++ and Python and to me it was a very good combination you know, getting the speed and the capabilities of C++ and accessing them, though, in a kind of an interactive way uh, from, uh, from Python. And it was a, a very powerful uh, approach, which I tried to replicate immediately when I started working on, on Pagamo. Uh, so we had a first version of Pagamo uh, in early 2009. Um, uh, it was, I think, a definite improvement to, with respect to the code that we had earlier. It was not still in its final form. It, has, uh, it still had some limitations. Uh, so I, I spoke to you about this island model so in which you have different algorithms trying to optimize the same problem uh, at the same time and then exchanging information. And this metaphor was realized through the use of uh, local threads in the initial version of, of Pagmo. Um, so you could just run Pagmo in parallel on a, on a single machine. It didn't have any kind of clustering capabilities or the ability to, you know, to dispatch these uh, uh, algorithms to other computers in a cluster or anything like this. Uh, the Python bindings in, uh, in, uh, in Pagmo, which are called Pigmo, uh, were not extensible in the sense that they were thought initially as just a way to access the capabilities of the software from, uh, from Python, but not to extend, like for defining your own algorithms or your own optimization problem from Python. Uh, this was a really a, a technical problem in the beginning because there was this huge stumbling block uh, uh, due to the fact that we uh, relied on local threads. And you know if you, if you try to interpret Python with threads, it can get a bit painful. So you have all the, uh, the gil to uh, step around. And, uh, and this was a technical problem that we weren't really able to solve in the beginning, and so we just provided a set of bindings in Python that, uh, uh, were able, with which you would be able to access the existing functionality in C++ of the software from Python. Uh, we open sourced it, so we mm, put on a Git repository. It wasn't on GitHub. I think it, at the beginning it was on, on, uh, on that uh, uh, Git, Git or CZ, the one where a very old repository. I don't know if it's still around. Um, and we started really using in the spirit of eating your own dog food uh, in, in research uh, within the team. So we had a, a, a lot of projects in, that, in those first two years that started to use Pagmo internally for doing uh, research papers. So um, building on the experience of, uh, of seeing how the users would react with the software and which kind of features and what, which kind of extension we wanted to have in the software uh, based on, on, on the actual usage of it, uh, we proceeded then to have the first um, overhaul uh, of the architecture of, uh, of, uh, of Pagmo. And we took part for the first time in the GSOC, which was in uh, uh, 2010 which was a very nice experience, of course, and uh, I, I warmly encourage anyone who has an open source project to, to try to go for the GSOC because it's, uh, uh, it's very nice. And um, um, we were able, in some sense, to sidestep the problems of, uh, with local threading, and uh, uh, this allowed us, on one sense, to go to clusters, and so be able to uh, implement this island model on clusters, or just machines interconnected with network in general. And we were able to uh, deploy fully extensible Python bindings, which means extensible, uh, essentially that uh, uh, it is now possible just to uh, define your own optimization problem and your own algorithms only from Python, and you can forget forever about the C++ part if you uh, want to do so. And uh, this was a very key point, because of course, if you are uh, distributing a software uh, uh, in, a, in, in, a, in Python, you want to be able to extend it and use it fully from it. And you don't want to, to have the need to have the full compiler toolchain on your back in order to extend it, because that's, it's a huge 
you know, stumbling block. And whereas if you have a kind of a pure Python thing, you can just forget about all this complexity and just uh, proceed. Um, so after this overhaul, after the GSOC, we had the, uh, a constant phase of accretion of features and uh, a kind of a maturity phase for the software, which goes on to this day. We just kept on adding more algorithms that you could use from, uh, uh, from Pagma, uh, drawing on the optimization, optimization algorithm available in a lot of different open source libraries like SciPy, Analopt, uh, GSL, IPOPT, um, and a lot of others. We implemented within Pagma a lot of state-of-the-art algorithms from the literature which are not actually available in any other open source library. We did a second GSOC in 2013 and then we finally uh, started working, Dario especially, put on the website and wrote a lot of documentation, tutorials, and uh, so it turned it into a, a proper open source project if you, if you want. So uh, this is the part where I give you my unsolicited opinion about scientific computing. And uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, some observation which are based on my experience both with Pagmo and both in the later years uh, as a scientific software developer. So uh, I think there are bright spots and dark spots in general about uh, scientific computing. Uh, and this is, I think is exemplified by, by what I told you about uh, earlier about the history of Pagmo. So um, I, I would argue that uh, scientific computing in general has, uh, has an emphasis on correctness and reproducibility to some extent, because it's, it's software which is uh, developed to uh, produce research results, to do science. And so in, uh, in general, uh, uh, it inherits to some extent the idea of the scientific method in which all your results must uh, stand as scrutiny of uh, uh, reproducibility. And uh, the, you, know, you, you must be able to uh, uh, prove the correctness uh, and, and this is mostly inherited by a lot of scientific software in the sense that uh, uh, before going out to a publication, you normally are required to do a lot of self-validation and try to be uh, as thorough as possible on this point, which is a, a very good thing. And uh, um, I would also argue that uh, scientific computing has been historically always a, a very powerful driver for uh, in innovation in high-performance computing. In fact, uh, historically, the first computers, like in the late 40s even, or 50s, early 50s, uh, they were bought by university departments in uh, like physics, astronomy, and so on and so forth. So it, it has an, uh, an history of, of driving the innovation in, in, some, in some sense in high performance computing. Uh, there are dark spots, I would say, from what is my experience, and uh, they all uh, uh, derive from the fact, from the fundamental fact, that a lot of scientists uh, are not trained to be software engineers. And uh, uh, this is a, uh, a problem. Uh, because often the scientific code is written with a kind of an horizon of one paper. So you, you write the code and you rush it to go through with the paper publication and uh, you forget about, of course, all the kind of best practices of software engineering because you need, you're pressured by the, you know, the publisher perish mentality to some extent. Um, so you need to rush and uh, you write code that is, becomes really nearly unmaintainable afterwards. Uh, so you often abandon it after using it, and you run into this cycle of reinventing the, the wheel, because uh, uh, it's, very, it's, it's not a common thing that software written for scientific purposes, like for papers, and gets actually published, and uh, uh, it gains wide acceptance. And this is a problem because a lot of researchers, they just keep on rewriting the same thing over and over, like basic libraries, basic utilities, and uh, it's, it's kind of a waste of resource in, in, uh, uh, in, in many respects. And of course, it's riddled with legacy code and tools, and, uh, um, and uh, you know, uh, these are all common problems that I've witnessed personally while working as a, as a scientific software developer. And, uh, uh, you know, the scientists, what do they want in terms of code and computing capabilities? Uh, they have a kind of a very wide-ranging and diverse sets of requirements that they want to uh, obtain for the, from, so from software and languages. Of course, they are eminently concerned with the performance. So, you know, the thirst for CPU power of scientists is, is well known. It's never enough. Uh, you can always do a uh, more detailed simulation uh, with more uh, fine-grained uh, definition if you have more computational power available. But, uh, you know, on the complete other opposite spectrum of, uh, of, of the scientific computing, uh, when scientists are toying with new ideas or trying different things, uh, they want to be able to do things fast and in a kind of an interactive and exploratory way. This is very important because you need to be able uh, to have something which has uh, a very low overhead in terms of uh, initial investment, something 
like a language or tools that are really able to, uh, to give you uh, the ability to, to play with things. And, uh, and in this sense, uh, you, you, you know very well that the scientific Python stack has, a, has been a resounding success, especially in the form of the IPython interactive notebook and uh, such tools that are uh, really becoming extremely popular nowadays. And of course, scientists was, want to be able to inspect, modify, and understand how thing works. And I think this uh, really resonates a lot with the, uh, with the hacking spirit of the open source community. I think, I think it's an important point of contact because um, you know, scientists often need to, to have tools and to uh, write code which is highly specialized, so they need to be able to see how other people have solved the same problem, maybe adapt the code uh, to their own needs. And so this kind of freedom and uh, 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 if you want uh, sharing of knowledge is, is a central component, I think, both of the scientific mindset and of the, of the open source mindset in some sense. So uh, just to talk to you a bit about the Pagma framework, uh, going back to the code. Uh, so uh, Pagma is built around a clear separation of, of concepts, try, tries to, to keep a lot of base concepts separated. Uh, so you have kind of uh, abstract base classes in C++ which define your algorithm and your problem and they are separated from each other, so you, in, in theory you, you should be able to use any kind of algorithm on any kind of problem, so uh, uh, they are kind of orthogonal. Um, there is an, a kind of an abstract island class that uh, includes a problem, an algorithm, and a population of candidate individuals, and uh, it has a kind of a virtual evolve method, which is tasked with uh, uh, dispatching the optimization run on uh, some agent, which could be a thread, local thread, like in the earlier version of Pagmo, or it could be also another process on the same machine, or on a process on another machine. So this evolved function is the one that provides you, if you want, with this uh, highly parallelizable uh, capability. And then you have uh, the notion of an archipelago, which is a connection of islands, which are linked by a topology. So they are linked with different, uh, you can uh, install different topologies on, uh, on, uh, on the archipelago and try to investigate how the type of communication and the, the links between the various islands influence the optimization process. And uh, in this topology is the roads across which the communication of uh, uh, data between algorithms happen. And uh, all these base classes are extensible, so you, you can, of course, define your own problems, algorithms, islands, and topologies. And you can do these extensions both from C++ or from Python, so depending on what your requirements are. Maybe you have a, a library which is C++ only, and you want to use it during optimization, and then you want, you want the C++ side. Maybe, I don't know, you want to use some Python library instead, like OpenCV or something uh, in your objective function, and then you extend your problem from Python. Uh, it has accumulated over the years a large collection of algorithms and uh, optimization problems which are already implemented. So you can just go and start uh, doing your computations with them if you want. There's about 50 algorithms, and plus meta-algorithms and other sorts of features which uh, were uh, mostly implemented in the last couple of years. Um, a key point uh, from a technical point of view uh, in, in Python is this bridge between C++ and Python. Yeah. So uh, we use Boost Python as our uh, uh, binding framework. Uh, I always used Boost Python also in the past and it was always a, a very good fit for, for this type of problems, but of course you could think of doing something similar with uh, you know, Swig for instance, or you could also go, think of going directly to the C Python API if you wanted. Uh, but Boost Python has, has proven a good, uh, good match for the type of C++ coding that we need to, to be able to bind. And we had to solve a, um, a series of kind of challenging and non-trivial issues over the lifetime of the project. Uh, there are a few of these. For instance, you have, uh, um, in, in order to be able to dispatch the evolution of, uh, of, uh, of an algorithm uh, to another machine, for instance, of course you need to be able to serialize everything and send it over the network. And, uh, but you, you have to remember that the core is in C++. So you need to, to, to have kind of a serialization a library which is able to cross the boundary between C++ and Python. So uh, you have a part of the uh, serialization library which calls C function and does the serialization of the C part and a part which overlays on top the serialization of the Python part because maybe you implemented your algorithm, your problem uh, in pure Python. So you need to serialize that part as well. And this was something that was a bit tricky to, to get right uh, because on the C++ side, you're dealing with the uh, abstract classes, with the uh, base pointer and all these type of things, which uh, can be a bit tricky sometimes to, uh, to deal with. 
uh, you can do the whole extensions of C++ classes can be done on the Python side. So you can inherit from a class which is defined in, uh, in C++ and is exposed in Python, and you can re-implement virtual methods which are originally were uh, virtual C++ methods and re-implement them on the Python side, for instance. Which this is essential because uh, the whole hierarchy is kind of object-oriented, so you need to be able to do this re-implementation of, uh, of virtual classes. Uh, we had to really uh, uh, labor a lot in order to find a good way to work around some of Python limitation in terms of parallel programming. So the global interpreter lock uh, means that you cannot really access Python concurrently from multiple threads uh, into the same interpreter. And uh, this was a problem in the beginning because it stopped us from doing a really uh, completely extensible from Python framework. Uh, uh, this was a problem, as I said in the beginning, when we had only the local parallelization, which was done via threads. And, uh, and we solved this by essentially, instead of using uh, uh, the threads for the computation, we just used the thread for the communication between the, the algorithms, but the actual uh, execution of the algorithm happens in a separate process using the multiprocessing module. So this uh, was what finally allowed us to uh, solve this, or to uh, clear this hurdle. Um, we do a lot of, uh, there is a lot of leveraging of, of Python strengths. Uh, I, I'm sure you probably are aware, the, you're all aware about the strength nowadays of the scientific Python stack, uh, which has been adopted and being used by researchers from all sorts of, of fields uh, in, in the last few years. And we do as well, yeah, reuse a lot of, of parts of the scientific Python stack uh, within Pagmo. Of course, the usual suspects, NumPy, SciPy algorithms, Matplotlib for uh, plotting the trajectories, for instance, and of course, IPython to do kind of interactive work with, uh, with Pago. Uh, a thing that we use that I, I haven't seen used too much, but uh, it's something which is very uh, interesting for us, uh, is the fact that uh, we are using the IPython cluster capabilities in order to, in some sense, to free us from the shackle of running on a single machine. Uh, IPython has a very nice kind of parallel computing framework uh, which is distributed across the network which you can take advantage of and we do this. So we have a, a kind of island which is based uh, on IPython and uh, which essentially spawns processes on computers in the network and then dispatches the uh, run of an algorithm and a problem uh, on that specific process on, the, on, the, on a separate computer on the network. And uh, this is a very, very nice way of doing parallel computing, uh, especially if you compare it uh, with the solutions like MPI uh, on the C++ side, which is maybe not the only possibility, but is certainly the most used uh, uh, parallel uh, uh, clustering library. And you can do anything like this, and it, you know, it's, it's really difficult to adapt MPI to this type of workload in which you have load balancing and uh, events going out, in and out of the network. And, and you know, IPython parallel processing really solves the, the problem for us in a, in a very nice way. And, um, Finally, this is the last slide about Pagmo. I, I wanted to give you some highlights of, or some example of the use of, of Pagmo that we did, uh, that we had during uh, my permanence at the European Space Agency. It was used a lot in the team uh, because there were a lot of tasks that we, which uh, could be uh, cast as optimization problems. And I just selected a, a few of these. Uh, one I'm particularly uh, fond of is uh, uh, we, we did a study with the, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory of NASA. I think in 2010 or 2009. And I don't know if you uh, are aware, but uh, uh, around 2009, the policy of NASA for uh, human exploration changed a bit focus and from uh, the distant goal of putting a human on Mars, they switched to another goal, which is that of exploring uh, near-Earth near asteroids and EA. And um, so the, uh, at that point in time, NASA started to look at the feasibility of space mission to asteroids. And uh, there are a huge amount of near-Earth asteroids. There are a huge catalog of these objects. And uh, if you want to have a mission to them, you need to find a way to select the most suitable um, asteroid according to um, some criteria, like uh, uh, you know, the, the distance at which the asteroid is. How easy is it to come back from the asteroid in case there are problems, like in the middle of the trajectory, uh, and you need to recover the asteroid? So there were a lot of complex criteria uh, that you need to take into account, and you would need to rank all these thousands of asteroids for the most suitable one to the least suitable one, according to this criteria. And so we were contacted by NASA, and uh, the idea was to try to run this optimization problem in parallel, 
uh, with, the, with their tools and with our tools at the same time and try to compare the results and see what if they uh, you know, matched or they were uh, asteroid candidates that would uh, pop out. So we ran the study and then we published uh, a paper about this in a conference and, uh, and it was uh, interesting because we reached exactly the same conclusions. Uh, so in some sense, the validation of the, validity of the uh, uh, suitability of the approach that we adopted in Pagma for optimization. So uh, I'd like to think if they ever go ahead with the, with the plan of actually sending men to asteroids, maybe there is a piece of, of Pagma in that <laughs> buried deep. Um, we also use Pagma in another field completely unrelated, which is that the evolution of artificial neural networks for autonomous Martian rovers. So the idea here is that uh, when you send a rover to, uh, to Mars, for instance, uh, what they do nowadays is they, they, you have a team of engineers which pilot the rover manually. But sometimes you would like to be able to have the uh, rover to be able to operate in a kind of a semi-autonomous way in case of sudden dangers or uh, you know, if uh, the communication with Earth breaks, you don't want the rover just to drive over a cliff or something like this. So you want to give it some kind of autonomous behavior. And the, one of the ideas that we explored was to use artificial neural networks to drive the rover. And uh, uh, we did a project with the University of Plymouth in which we used uh, uh, PAGMO uh, in order to evolve some kind of artificial brain on the rover so that it could uh, achieve certain objectives like avoiding <laughs> obstacles and this type of classical things in artificial intelligence and robotics. And this was also a very interesting project. And, uh, and the guy that ran the project from the University of Plymouth, he has a nice source forge page in which he has this Mars simulator which you can hook up to PAGMO and uh, try to uh, optimize the, the behavior of the, ray, the rover. It has some graphics capabilities as well. And then we used a lot uh, PAGMO in, a, in a GTOC, which is an international competition. It's called the Global Project Optimization Competition. And it is, a, um, it is an occasion in which uh, the space agency from all over the world, they try to solve in a kind of a competitive way uh, challenging problems in trajectory design and uh, to find new solutions uh, and new ways of tackle this difficult problem. And uh, uh, throughout the uh, various participation of the ACT to GTOC, we often, very often use Pagmo to, to try to, to tackle these new problems. So uh, this concludes a bit the part about Pagmo. I'm going to give a couple of slides about AstroPy now. Um, so AstroPy is a project I've been involved with since I'm uh, at the Max Planck Institute since May this year. Uh, it's a library for doing astronomical uh, type of computations. It's, um, in some sense, it's uh, superficially similar to Pagmo, at least in scope, a bit, and uh, in the sense that it's a scientific Python library. But in, in many other ways, it's a, it's a diff very different project. Yeah, it's a tool which was born to satisfy the practical needs of uh, professional astronomers. So it has a bunch of features, uh, like the handling of units, quantities, and constants, uh, the handling of FITS files. FITS files are the uh, image format which is used to deal with astronomical images. So it's a kind of a bitmap with additional metadata and all sorts of things. Uh, convolution and filtering utilities, cosmological calculations, model fitting, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so it was born with the precise object, objective of satisfying some practical uh, needs on the moment of professional astronomers. So it's not a research software, it's a, it's a software for doing research in, in this sense, um, whereas Pagmo is more kind of a research software. Uh, it has NumPy, NumPy as the only dependency. You can install it on uh, Linux, OS X, Windows. And uh, uh, it has a, a wonderful community around it. It's um, seriously one of the best community uh, run projects I've ever seen. It has a, a very uh, well done website with lots of documentation. Uh, tutorials, examples, uh, kept up to date. Uh, they adopt very, very um, uh, strict software engineering uh, um, uh, best practices. Like they have all this con continuous integration thing going. Uh, they have a, 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 a contribution model based on the GitHub, so with pull requests, bug reports, and uh, all, the, all the things which uh, we are familiar with. And uh, um, it has a wide selection of affiliated packages, so uh, there is a kind of a constellation of different packages that live around AstroPy that uh, use it, and they are not really part of the core AstroPy distribution, but they might be one day, uh, but they depend on it, and they adopt the same kind of coding guidelines and uh, for documentations and uh, for coding style and so on and so forth. Uh, so the AstroPy code is overwhelmingly is a Python code. Um, it has, has a really heavy reliance on, on NumPy to, uh, 
to do in, in, in his inner workings. Uh, for instance, one of the prominent things is this table class, which is essentially a thin wrapper around the, the NumPy uh, multidimensional array, which lets you deal with the uh, tables dressed up, or better, NumPy arrays dressed up as tables, so it has uh, all sorts of uh, facilities to deal with the uh, data in a, in, a, in a table format, and it's very uh, handy and convenient to use. Uh, it has bits of Fortran, C, and Cython for performance. Uh, actually, we're currently also investigating the use of Numba for the future. So it, uh, you know, it tries to, we try to keep up with the, also the latest advancement in this field because, of course, sometimes you need to go to the uh, core uh, uh, performance route for certain things, like if you have to handle some images. And in that case, you have a bit of uh, different choices to do this. You can do straight C with a C, Python C API, or you can go Cython, or again, you can go Numba maybe in the future. And uh, one, big, uh, uh, one big thing about this project, I think, is that uh, in some sense, it tries to bridge the gap between uh, a wide selection of astronomical software which has been developed over the past 30, 40 years, and uh, try to make it available from the Python side, and uh, uh, with, the, with the long term goal of, of slowly, if you want, replacing uh, uh, the existing astronomical software with better version based on Python. So for instance, there is a project which is called Montage Wrapper, uh, which is essentially a, a Python code that uh, uh, calls internally a very popular astronomical software, which is called Montage, which is uh, dealing with uh, assembling pieces of an images in uh, one single images and reproject it in different uh, uh, type of, uh, of points of view and all these type of things. And uh, the idea here is that uh, you provide a kind of a stopgap measure by wrapping this capability, which is not still available in AstroPy, but eventually in the future, uh, you, the goal is to replace it and to, and to make a better version of it in Python. Uh, so it has a very kind of nice uh, mission statement in some sense. Um, and as I already mentioned, that all the development is done in the GitHub workflow, and it's very well tested and documented, and you know runs Travis on all the pull requests, and you know it does all the things I think in a, in a very proper way. Uh, I really warmly uh, uh, recommend you to to go and look about uh, and uh, have a look at the AstroPy website because uh, it's it, I think it's a very well run project. Uh, uh, it's very well documented. Uh, there's a lot of information on the website, and the community is extremely friendly uh, with the active mailing list and. Uh, 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 chat channels. So, uh, as the last thing, uh, this is the last slide actually of my presentation, and I always feel like uh, there is no astronomical presentation which is not, uh, you need a pretty picture of some kind to, to end up. And I can explain you the, to you what this is. This is another example of, uh, of, in some sense, of an affiliated package. This is a synthetic image. It has been produced by a simulation software which is called Hyperion. And this is a software that uh, my boss at the Max Planck Institute wrote. Um, it's a mixture of Fortran and Python. And what this software does is essentially, um, it simulates a region of space in which you have dust, typically like in the center of galaxy or in uh, regions where stars are born. Uh, you put artificial stars inside this cloud of dust. Uh, and then you, you, you let packages of photon emitted from these uh, uh, stars. And uh, the, you, you try to uh, do essentially a software rendering of the photons going through the uh, uh, dust cloud. And you look what happens from the outside. So you're trying to simulate and reproduce what you're seeing in astronomical images. Uh, these regions with a reach of dust are very difficult to probe because, of course, the dust shields you from kind of direct observation. So you need to be able to simulate uh, and to try to create synthetic observation of this so you can compare them to what you're actually seeing in the sky and trying to deduce scientific facts about it. So like the type of stars that might be in there, the number of them, and uh, you know, how they emit uh, the properties of the dust and so on and so forth. And, uh, and this is one of the, uh, IP, uh, IPN is one of, if you could say it's one of the affiliated packages of AstroPy because it, uh, uh, it depends upon AstroPy for a lot of the data handling and, uh, and the shuffling uh, and, uh, and the managing of, of the, all the images, for instance. And uh, so it's, uh, um, you know, uh, AstroPy is the most prominent package which I'm working on, but there is a constellation of research efforts uh, which are increasingly being based on AstroPy. And uh, all the code that runs this type of simulation is also available on GitHub, and it's also well documented, so if you want to go and try to run it, you, you can, of course. 
and is an example of a new trend, if you want, in this community of, of astronomy and uh, astrophysics, which I think is very healthy because they are uh, slowly, uh, in some sense, migrating towards this the approach adopted by other communities, such as bioinformatics, of having this kind of very open development, in this case, based on Python, which I think is very healthy for, for a scientific uh, endeavor. So I don't have a conclusion slides, uh, but I have some conclusions. And, um, you know, I, I, I talked to you about two, di two, di two different softwares today. Um, superficially, they're similar, as I said, uh, in the sense that they deal with space stuff, and uh, they are both Python and scientific software uh, projects. Uh, under the skin, though, they are pretty much different because Pagamo is kind of a more research software oriented towards pure performance and uh, towards proving a point in some sense and using to being used to write papers and uh, a kind of a more exploratory type of software. Uh, whereas AstroPy is a more kind of practical type of tool, uh, written mostly in Python, uh, with an emphasis on other uh, priorities. And uh, to me, the idea that uh, uh, Python is able to cater to the needs of both these projects is, is you know, is a great testament to the to the power of the language. And uh, you know, Python is not the perfect language for scientific computing in the sense that there is no perfect thing in, in general for anything but it's an extremely good langu language for, uh, for doing scientific computing, uh, despite some of these flows that, uh, like uh, uh, the, from parallel computing, which, you know, they might be solved in the, in the future. And um, yeah, so uh, it seems like that also the astronomical and the astrodynamical com uh, community is heading towards this road of uh, uniforming around Python. And uh, to me, it's interesting to see how Python has displaced, has displaced different tools in these two examples, because Pagmo, in some sense, displaced existing C and MATLAB code and uh, displaced with, uh, with Python code. And, uh, and AstroPy is, uh, is displacing existing Fortran code uh, and replacing it with Pagmo. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a um, huge movement of the community, which uh, I think it uh, only uh, bodes well for the future. And uh, yeah, and that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Hello. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, and before we start with questions, I think now might be an incredibly convenient time to remind you all that in all of your conference bags is a little card for linux.conf.au 2015, which three days ago announced its astronomy mini conf, um, an entire day of talks dedicated to astronomy and the sciences. So that's in Auckland in January. Um, you should go to that too, it'll be fun. Um, so hands up. I'm interested in your, uh, whether you've been able to determine whether it's better to have horizontal or vertical scaling for your, uh, sorry, your grab, uh, horizontal or vertical scaling, sorry, yeah, breadth or depth for your scaling. Uh, how do you determine a sweet spot for your algorithms? Or do you determine a, whether well, it's better it, it's, to have a bigger machine or lots of machines? Well, it's, um, that type of task is, is really kind of embarrassingly parallel. So, so far we have really to hit kind of uh, scaling issues with that, in the sense that uh, um, each time you run an optimization algorithm is, uh, is eminently a kind of uh, uh, CPU-bound problem. So you have to transfer a very little amount of data, and you run it maybe for, uh, for a few minutes. So we really haven't been able to, to determine a kind of, uh, of a point in which uh, uh, the thing starts to break down during, to, during to overhead of communication. It's also true that we didn't really have uh, access to huge clusters, so we didn't really exercise it in the, <laughs> Uh, in, the, um, in, a, in, a, in a big um, iron type of setup. Uh, there are things which uh, uh, we know there is, a, there is going to be a kind of a scalability issue at, at some point, but since we really don't, uh, haven't run into it yet, we haven't thought really about uh, too much. And uh, the, the, the parallelization is kind of self-balancing in the sense that you have algorithms uh, that have different uh, performance uh, uh, characteristics. So one algorithm might run for a few minutes, the other might be, might be done in a few seconds. So the, the whole thing kind of self-balances on, on demand in this sense. So there is, there is only one point of, of a bottleneck, which is the fact that at, at, at the present time, the communication is not completely peer-to-peer, -peer, but it needs to go through a kind of a central node. So that's the... 
Hi, um, I've got a question actually about that pretty picture there. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like people um, run a simulation, look at astronomical pictures, and just compare them in a qualitative way. Is that the case? No, no yeah, usually not. Uh, there are certainly some information that you can get in a qualitative point of view, but what they do is they do like spectroscopy on this thing, and then they measure this image. Uh, for instance, this is only an, an image, I think, in, in the infrared. Uh, band. But really, when you do the simulation, you have a kind of, a, not a flat image, but a cube of images at all different wavelengths. So you, this is a slice of, of, the, of the simulation. And you can get all sort of quantitative information by doing uh, image analysis the same way you would do with a real image. And actually better, because you know exactly what are the numbers directly from the simulation. So, I mean, the, the pictures are nice to, to look at, and, uh, but the, the actual science is, uh, is done via quantitative information. Time for two more questions. Um, have you been looking at the work happening around Spark and Blaze and that kind of thing for distributed computation yet? Or? Um, not, not, I, I'm, I'm a bit aware of it in the sense that there was a bit of, of talk on the, on the AstroPy mailing list. Uh, but uh, um, for our needs, in, in Pagam at least, there is not much need of that type of, 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 of power. But for AstroPy, it's definitely something that people are, are interested. And, uh, you know, one of the main developers of, of AstroPy is uh, Michael Dretboom, which you, you all know from the Matplotlib fame. So uh, I think he mentioned a few weeks ago after a uh, presentation in, uh, in, uh, about uh, uh, Blaze in the US, and he brought it to the attention of the mailing list, and it looks like certainly something that uh, I would say AstroPy would use much rather than, uh, than Pagma, I would say. Yes. Uh, yeah, I got another question about the parallelization strategy that you described before with respect to using processes instead of threads, and the question there is, um, how, did you, how do you determine the um, ideal number of processes to run on a particular node, i.e. do you use the number of cores, and the other question is, um, are these processes then single-threaded themselves? Yes, uh, so the processes are single-threaded themselves. And uh, well, the way the way the cluster is set up now uh, is uh, you have to kind of set up it manually. So what we do is just we run uh, one different uh, IPython process per uh, uh, processor available on the machine. So that's what we, we do. And then uh, you know they just uh, they just keep on receiving new packages of work as as they, they complete new ones. So. Please thank me. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Francesco <laughs> for crossing the entire world to get here.